not quite half of our churches, uh, 40% approximately, um, cannot operate with the funds within their community. These, these are small communities, um, uh, tiny communities. The last community that we served in was Sheridan Lake Bible Church, 65 people in that town. There was a yellow blinking light and Walmart was 45 miles away. That's right. And we were the only gospel preaching church within a 30 mile radius. And so most VM churches are in areas like that. They're very remote. Um, but coming back to our being here, I kind of went down a rabbit trail there. Um, our district representatives um, were asked by the leaders of the mission, do you know an older couple who are serving in one of our churches that could possibly come down here in the winter and, and do this work for village missions? And our, our DR, um, Sean and his wife, Janie Carney, said that sounds like the Lambrights. They have grandkids in Yuma. And uh, some other things were happening health-wise. Uh, Connie's doctor was recommending the Southwest because of her rheumatoid arthritis. And, and so um, they're just, we could just see God opening this door for us. Uh, I wasn't excited about leaving Sheridan Lake Bible Church. It was really hard. The people there um, loved us and we loved them and, and we were blessed to be there. And they were a little upset with Village Missions for taking us, but Anyway, that's how we come to be here. And this past winter, um, you know, the whole winter for me has been really different. When you've been in pastoral ministry for over 30 years and all of a sudden you're not doing that, it's a change. And, and I just continued to feel God's call to preach the word. And, um, and God opened up this opportunity for us this spring to go to South Dakota to do that. There are about 20 churches without pastors right now across the U.S. with village missions. And so that's one of the prayer requests that I would share with you. Tonight, I wanted to share from God's word. And one of my favorite churches um, and favorite epistles was uh, Paul's letter to the church of Thessalonica and his ministry at Thessalonica. And what I want to share with you tonight is about witnessing paul's witness within these churches philippi uh and after uh he was in philippi i believe it was thessalonica and then berea and then on eventually to athens macedonia was a, a rough tour for paul i don't know if tour is the right word but um he suffered and his team they were imprisoned of course at philippi we know that story in acts chapter 16 the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And he and his whole household did. And God worked miraculously in hearts, uh, opening the hearts of people to the gospel. And it was Paul's witness, but it didn't come easily. Paul was literally run out of these towns after sharing his faith. Thessalonica was one of them and he was there just a brief time and he had to flee as he did Philippi and, and I believe Berea. And so he wrote to this church. Um, but after his, after he got to, to Athens, he, uh, in Acts chapter 16, I want to read a couple of verses from this chapter, verse 9 and verse 10. This is Paul kind of catching his breath, coming to Corinth and Imagine having been beaten and all that he experienced, fleeing for his life, beaten, thrown in prison in Philippi, and here he is ministering at Corinth. And verse 9 says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Boy, Paul must have breathed a sigh of relief at that word from the Lord. Because Macedonia was a rough, tough ministry for him. And think of that in the context of witnessing. Uh, several times I've had opportunity, um, actually twice, uh, I received evangelism explosion training. Maybe some of you have. And one of the things I learned through them and their um, teaching 
a method of sharing the gospel was that there are two things that um, cause believers, Christians, to not share their faith. Does anybody know what those two things might be? Fear. Yes. Bop. What's it? Bop and pop. Fear of failure, fear of people. Fear of a number of different things. And Paul, here he is. Jesus says, do not be afraid. And it's interesting when you read his first letter to Corinth, he said, I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling. And some uh, believe that Paul may have been talking about his 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 experience through Macedonia. And when he got to to Athens, to Corinth, he was fearful of, of all that he had experienced. We don't think of the great apostle Paul being afraid, but Jesus tells him, do not be afraid. He was a faithful witness, but fear is the one thing that evangelism explosion, the first thing that they point out. The second thing, does anybody know what that might be? Any of you EE students here that maybe took it years ago? The second reason is that we, we fail to share our faith because we, we think we'll mess it up. We're, we're not equipped. We, we don't know what we would say. And um, so many fail to share their faith because they, they, they'll stumble or bumble through it. And that reminds me of a man who I trained with in Evangelism Explosion in Winnipeg. And I think I might have told the story about him. This was in a big Filipino church, and we were all being trained in evangelism explosion. And this man, I can't remember his name, but I'm going to pass this picture around. He's the only man in this picture that has white hair. He was from Toronto, Canada, and he had a speech impediment. He could not put a sentence together that made sense. And I thought, why is this man here being trained to share his faith? He was a widower, and he wanted to learn to share his faith. He he was older. I don't know how old he was. Probably my age now. I'm not sure. But I'll pass this picture around and, and you'll note him. But after our training in evangelism and explosion, we went out to share our faith. And it was his turn. I wasn't with his team. But we came back after sharing in the streets of Winnipeg. The church gave us their visitation list. It was a Filipino church. So we were visiting people that had come to their church and sharing the gospel. Well, this man, he was so excited, and he he said, she came to faith in Christ, and I don't remember his exact words, but he stumbled through sharing about what happened, and there's a part when you share the gospel through EE, you ask the question, does this make sense to you? And she looked at him and said, yes, it makes sense to me. And as he was sharing this with us after the fact, he said, it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> But God used him and God's word. I mean, it is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And evangelism explosion uses, I think it's 16 or 17 scripture verses, the gospel. And so it's the power of, of God unto salvation. Right. But I share that story about him um, because he was not fearful to share his faith. He was faithful. And that's what God calls us to, to do as well. How much time do I have? No problem. Take um, it away. I want to share some other things, and I'm going to come back to Thessalonica, and we'll look at some verses from uh, actually Paul's first letter there. But I think about uh, our time seems short, doesn't it, to you before the return of the Lord? And in our letter, our prayer letter, and I I don't know, did I pass those out? I'm, I'm holding them up here. I, I quote from Peter, and he writes in his letter, the end of all things uh, is at hand. That's 1 Peter 4, 7. Can you imagine Peter writing that some, uh, how, how many years ago was that? Quite a few, a couple Thank thousand you, years. Yeah. Anyway, that's our recent prayer letter that we're sending out to our friends. Tells us a little a bit about our work as I'm sharing here tonight. But, um, Many Christians are saying, man, the Lord Jesus must be just around the corner. You know, it, it, it's got to be close. What we're seeing happening. Of course, we don't know. No man knows the day or the hour. The Bible's clear on that. Jesus is very clear on that. But what should we be doing? And as I think of that, I think of Paul 
when this is writing to Second Corinthians, he, he talks about being compelled. Yes. What compels you? And I guess that's a question I just throw out for you tonight. And one of the things that's compelled me this last winter and not being preaching the word and hearing God continually to speak to me through his word to continue to preach the word, I felt compelled to do that. And it is in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians um, that Paul speaks about what compels us. And I'd like to read verses 14 and 15. He says, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That's the gospel in there. And it compelled Paul and us. He uses the word us, but he speaks about living for him. And there are lots of ways that, that we should be living for Jesus. Um, but it includes our witness for him. Uh, Peter asked the question, what manner of people ought we to be in holy, in holy conduct? And he speaks of that in the context of the day of the Lord as well. I think that's in his second epistle. One of the things that we need to be compelled to do is, is to seek holiness and uh that's the first thessalonians the theme of that letter there's two themes the first is the main theme is the second coming of christ uh chapter four and and that is is a beautiful um exposition of teaching on the return of christ and these thessalonians paul had only been there a few days they they didn't know they they didn't have first thessalonians <laughs> like we do they needed to be taught about the return of the lord and so that was one of the main things that, that Paul addressed in his letter. But the second theme, secondary theme, is sanctification. And, and some things that should compel us is our walk with the Lord, holiness, and, and sanctification, because those words kind of mean the same. They interchange. But also, we're getting close to the, the return of the Lord. And many of us believe that. Uh, our witness, our witness, it's so important. It's so important, and we see that in Paul going to Thessalonica, his call, responding to the call, the Macedonian call, and remember that, that story. It's in Acts. I believe it's chapter 16. They were going to go somewhere else, and, and they had this vision, a man from Macedonia, come and help us. I've often wondered, was that man from Philippi or Berea or Thessalonica? We don't know. But we know that many came to faith in Christ, and it was a call of God for them to go and to be a witness. And they were a faithful witness in the midst of persecution, and they experienced great persecution. But to live for him, coming back to Paul's words there in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, and I read those verses, um, uh, and again, I want to read, to read them. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We, we need to be living for him. There's lots of things that we can be living for. When I came to Yuma, I was overwhelmed by the, the senior people down here and in all of the churches. And another, another thing that overwhelmed me was the wealth of things. Uh, we've been in small town America for many years. And you see, um, you don't see uh, the affluence here. And I speak to that in my letter a little bit. And it just, it just caught me off guard. And I thought, oh, I'm on Social Security. I could take my ease and buy a razor and race over the Yuma Hills. I think I mentioned that in my letter. Would I be living for Jesus doing that? Well, some would debate that. And I don't want to debate that tonight. But I, I feel compelled to live for him in terms of holiness and my witness and to preach the word. To live for him, we must pursue holiness. And Hebrews tells us, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see God. And again, going back to Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, he said, this is the will of God, your sanctification. And so it should be something that we are pursuing and joining God in through his word and by his spirit. To live for him again, we must be a witness. 
And there's so many scriptures to this. I think of Acts 1-8, one, one evangelism explosion emphasizes this passage. And Jesus said, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utter, the, up to the end of the earth. And again, I come back to Paul's words, the love of Christ compels us. And he was compelled to share the gospel. And he did uh, through many dangers. And he wrote about those. Witnesses. Well, we've talked about his witness. What about the Thessalonians? This church, I believe, is the model church in the New Testament. It was not a perfect church. Paul addressed some of the issues in the church. One of the problems was they thought Jesus was coming, I mean, ASAP. And so some of them quit working and were, you know, they were just lollygagging. They, they weren't continuing with their work and their jobs. Um, and so Paul had to speak to them. He used the word busybodies. When you're not working, and what do you do? And they talked a lot. And, and so there were some things in the church that needed to be dealt with. Certainly the issue of sanctification. But really, this church is one of the, the few churches that Paul really commends. And I want to read some verses. He begins in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 2 and 3. He says, we give thanks to God always for you, for, for all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Paul commends Thessalonica for their witness and their work of faith and their labor of love. If, if there was anything that could be commended, think of those things that when we stand before the Lord and, and he says, well got, done, good and faithful servant, to, to be commended for our work of faith and our labor of love and our patience of hope. Paul commended them for proclaiming Christ everywhere. And, and this to me, I've heard people say, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I leave that to the pastors. I leave that to the evangelists and those that have the gift of evangelism. And Paul does uh, write, I believe it's to Ephesus, and he mentions the gifts and, and the gift of evangelism is mentioned there. But he, he says, God has given to each one of us a gift. But I want to come back to this church and their witness. We've talked about Paul's witness and the witness of his missionary team that was with him and how faithful they were to preach the gospel in, in uh, severe situations, per persecution. They, they fled for their lives. They were beaten, thrown in prison and, and all of that. But also there were those within these churches that were persecuted as well. Paul commended them, and this is in verses 6, and, 6 through 8 in the first chapter of First Thessalonians. And he says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word, of, the word of the Lord in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. For your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Wow. This was a witnessing church. And Paul had only been there, uh, I don't know, days, a short time. We don't know for sure. But it's just amazing to see the power of their witness and their faithful witness. And did they all have the gift, the gift of evangelism? Uh, they were disciples of Christ. They were excited to share their newfound faith in Christ. And so they were faithful. And, and Paul says they went everywhere. That kind of reminds me of village missions. They go to a lot of these remote places that a lot of churches, in fact, churches have pulled out of a lot of these little towns. They've closed the doors and they've said, you can't support a pastor. Um, and, and they just pull out. And then these little churches and these communities hear about village missions. Somebody tells them or knows a village missions church or pastor, and they contact village missions. Village missions comes in and visits with the little group, however many they are. And, and they, as the Lord leads, provide a missionary family to go in there. And they look at those communities as, as mission fields because most often 
that's the only gospel preaching church in that area in many of these uh, places uh, across rural, rural America where we were in Sheridan Lake we were the only gospel preaching church within a 30 mile radius and the town that we're going to be going to in interior South Dakota there's three churches there and and I talked to one of the elders a couple of weeks ago and, and he said those denominations ordain you can guess and he said we're the only gospel light and witness in this little town we haven't had a pastor for over a year our people are discouraged pray for us that we will go and encourage them through the word the word is where we are encouraged strengthened in our faith this church was faithful and, and it just amazes me that they're commended for their witness and that they went everywhere uh, being a witness, and these are just scriptures that you know, being a witness is Christ's command, the Great Commission. And, and Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. And we are disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, believers of Christ. And so we are to be a witness. And we can, and, and he calls us to be witnesses. In fact, in Acts 1.8, he said, you shall be witnesses. Have you ever thought about the fact that you are a witness, indirectly or directly? And we display Christ. People can see Christ in us. But the witness of these Thessalonians was they shared the word. It says they shared the word of the gospel. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes, we witness with our testimony. That's powerful. And often our, our testimony uh, is often more powerful than our words if we're not living our faith, if, if we're not walking the way we should be walking. Another thing that comes to my mind about being a witness, have you ever thought about Jesus' high priestly prayer? And part of that prayer, he prayed this. He says, I pray, praying to God the Father, I pray for those who will believe on me through their word. And that was in regard to his disciples. He was praying, but he's praying for us as well. Think about the, the opportunities that you've had to share your faith. And perhaps think about people that you've shared your faith with that have come to Christ. It is a wonderful thing to see a person come to faith in Christ. I remember a young man in our former church in Sheridan Lake. He'd come in, sit in the back pew. And, you know, he wasn't there all the time, but pretty soon he's pretty regular. He's coming quite regularly. And... I did get to meet him. He was working with one of the, the farmers, one of the big farmers there in Floyd. And one Sunday afternoon, he came to the parsonage and he was troubled. And I think Connie got me up from a nap. I don't remember exactly what happened, but went over to the church and we visited. And he wasn't sure if he was a believer and he wanted to make sure. He came to me and I shared the gospel with him and he prayed to receive Christ. He thought that he had when he was a child. He wasn't sure. And, and I said, you can know for sure. You can make that decision. And he, he did that day. And I think it was a week later that he was baptized and I flooded the whole church. That's a whole other story. The baptistry flooded over on Saturday. And, and one of the deacons said, Pastor, you didn't have to baptize the whole church. <laughs> Maybe you did. But exciting stories about sharing christ i remember a lady in another church and uh this lady we had never met her we were brand new in the ministry in in north dakota a little church there and we were visiting an elderly lady in in the hospital with uh, one of the couples of the church they took our along, took us along to introduce her to her, her name was matilda we went, went and visited matilda and and then Dan, after we left, we're walking down the hall of the hospital. He said, oh, there's another lady from our community that's in the hospital here. We need to introduce you uh, to her as our new pastor. And, and he said, she's, uh, she doesn't go to church, and she's kind of had a rough past. And so I remember her door was open. We knocked on the door, and I heard this booming voice, friend or enemy. <laughs> and all I could see was the end of her hospital bed. And I saw these cowboy boots sticking up out from under the blanket. And 
her voice didn't sound very feminine. And so the four of us went in in fear and trepidation. I guess I was fearful, kind of like what we we're reading here. Paul was <laughs> fearful when he got to Athens. And um, Dan and the others conversed with her, and he introduced us to her. And she said, Dan said, this is our new pastor. And she said, well, what did you do with your old pastor? And everything that was said to her, there was a comeback. And it was like, and I just kept thinking, um, boy, I don't sense the spirit moving here. And and, um, and it is the spirit that brings a person to Christ. I believe that. Uh, no man comes to the Father, but the Father draw him. But anyway, um, we conversed, and it was more I listened to her and Dan because they knew each other, of course. And she was she was in there. She was dying of um, liver cancer. She was a town alcoholic and um, and really needed the Lord. And so at the end of our conversation, I asked her, her name was Bernie. I said, Bernie, can I pray for you? And she said, you can, but it won't do any good. And I was just struck by that. I was struck by her harshness. And, and so I just remember praying a very simple prayer for her. I do remember praying this, that she would come to know the love of Jesus. And after I prayed, I said, Bernie, I'll be back next week to visit Matilda. Can I stop in and see you? And she said, well, I guess so. The following week, she gave her life to Christ. Change. That mean, harsh voice and temperament. She lived a couple months, and I just saw her glow and the change in her. And, and, and I thought back when I had shared Christ with her, boy, sometimes you, you just kind of like think it's time to stop and you don't want to push. And I, I thank God that he gave me that opportunity the second time to continue to share with her. There's times that we need to overcome our fears, really. Always we need to overcome our fears by God's grace. Jesus prayed for our witness. Um, our work of faith includes our witness. I come back to Paul's words in Ephesians, and he says, To each one grace was given. His love, the grace of God in Christ Jesus, should compel us to share the love of Christ with others. And to each one grace was given. And those are gifts Paul's talking about in that chapter, actually. I love this verse in Ephesians 2.10, and I use it in my letter. If you read my letter, Paul, after telling us how we can be saved in Ephesians 2.8 and 9, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God planned beforehand that we should walk in them. Have you ever thought about all the places that you've been where God has taken you? you think of it ministries and churches and, and mission work overseas that God planned that all beforehand. And our going to South Dakota, that was foreordained and planned in the providence of God that we should go and that we should uh, be obedient to God's call. Well, VM has asked us this uh, spring here recently to uh, be a witness in South Dakota. I've shared briefly about that church. Um, it's a very small church. Uh, just to tell you briefly about Village Missions, um, Village Missions is, as I said, often the only gospel witness in, in these little communities. And they, again, they emphasize two things, preach the word and love the people. This happens to be the 75th year anniversary of Village Missions. And I was hoping we'd get that up there because it's about the 75th anniversary. But we'll see here. I'm almost done and we'll see if it works. Um, rural America needs Jesus. We, this country, I mean, it's it's frightening what's happening across our country. Where we were in eastern Colorado, in Colorado, marijuana is legal. And a lot of people would stumble into Colorado from Kansas. Where's the first dispensary? Wanting to find, you know, their uh, marijuana dispensary. I remember this young man that walked into town and he was, you know, wanted to know where it was. And he actually had a devotional book with him. And, and I shared the gospel with him. He wasn't very responsive, but he seemed to be a believer. And I said, why do you want to put that stuff in your body? The body or the Bible tells us that we're to be filled and controlled with God's spirit. And uh, he just didn't make a whole lot of sense. I think he had some mental issues. 
But I say that just to remind you that these rural communities are often forgotten places. Kind of like overseas, there's lots of forgotten places that need the Lord and they need a missionary to go and tell them about Jesus. Just over a few years of ministry experience, these are just some statements I've heard from people in in some of these rural communities. Um, One young man said, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Can you help me? That was the young man I told you about earlier. Uh, Another young man, Pastor, I've sinned. Have I lost my salvation? This was a believer in Christ. This was a prodigal young man who had walked away from the Lord. Another person said, I've been thinking about suicide. I was molested many, many years ago. Uh, Pastor, I'm struggling with pornography. That is an epidemic in our churches. There hasn't been a church that we've pastored where that's not been a problem. Uh, I remember a young lady or a lady in middle-aged lady came through Sheridan Lake. This was, I think, our first year there. It was a Wednesday night. Our car broke down. She had to wait for parts since we were having prayer meeting. I invited her in Bible study. She said, I've got a Bible in my car. And she went to her car, brought in her big Bible, sat down. And we had no sooner prayed. And she opened her Bible and said, I don't believe that Jesus is God. Can you imagine? And so I said, let's let's walk through your Bible a little bit. And we showed her a number of scriptures. And every time we would look at one and read it, oh, I never saw that before. But these are things that you hear in rural communities. And we were able to share with her the deity of Christ. And she, I believe, came to know Christ. And I remember this statement. I heard this just last summer. And this was from a Catholic man and his family. They were devout Catholics. And this man, who was actually the mayor of our town, and his mother was in hospice. And I had visited her. And I had shared the gospel with her husband many times. And she was dying, and she knew that. And she made this statement to her son. Not too long before she died, and she she asked him, have I done enough good works to get into heaven? And I had shared that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone many, many times with her husband. These are people in rural communities that don't know the truth. And it is the truth that sets them free in Christ. So pray for village missions and for the pastors that are there. Um, There's 20 some churches without pastors right now. And I mentioned that 40% of these churches need support to stay open. Uh, And pray for our work of faith and labor of love and witness in South Dakota, that it will be that, that God uh, through his spirit and his word will touch hearts there. Thank you, Pastor, for giving us this time to share. I don't know. The, do we have the video? It's about, about six minutes long, and I think there's a picture of the church we're going to, too, perhaps. Not sure about that. It's, it's oh, not very good. Oh, no. It's great. 